Ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a very warm welcome to this evening's lecture. My name is Adrian Bowman. Um, I am uh, an Emeritus Professor of Statistics in the University here and also, as it happens, on the Council of the Royal Philosophical Society. And so I've got the pleasure of giving you a double welcome. The first is from the University, as tonight's lecture is part of an annual series which was established a few years ago through the generosity of an anonymous donor. And by the way, the name of the lecture series uh, is also at the generous suggestion of the donor. The aim of the series is to highlight the crucial importance of statistics and the mathematical sciences more generally in addressing issues of major public importance. And tonight's lecture fulfills that brief superbly, as I will explain shortly. That's the first welcome. The second welcome is from the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow. And for those of you who are not members, this is a body which for more than 200 years now has been organizing lectures and discussions on fascinating subjects and continues to do so. Please ask at the desk if you would like to find out more about the program for this year, um, of which this jointly organized lecture is part. Can I check I'm being heard clearly at the back? Thank you. But I'm gonna give you a double welcome in a different sense, because uh, while we have a very full lecture theater here, uh, we also have over 200 people registered to participate online. So firstly, welcome to those of you in the building. And now I'm going to make the standard uh, required announcements about if the fire alarm sounds, please make your way to the exit either at the front or through this door. Uh, there's a fire exit at the back. And uh, please switch off your mobile phone if you have one. And uh, I think that's all the, uh, the main things to say. You've probably already discovered that the toilets are one floor down. But the second further warm welcome is uh, to those who are joining us online. When I was in, myself inviting uh, some people to come and uh, enjoy the lecture this evening, one couple said they would love to do so, but they would have to join online because they would be on holiday in Barbados. So isn't it good to know that here we are on a Glasgow cold, dark November evening, and some participants are sipping cocktails on a sun-soaked veranda. So, so cheers to you, uh, the online participants, wherever in the world you may be. Well, without more ado, the lecture tonight is being given by Sir Paul Collier, who is a professor of economics and public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government in the University of Oxford. Sir Paul has a long and very distinguished career studying the plight of countries and now also communities within countries which are stuck in persistent poverty. The insights in his very extensive published work are gained in part from careful examination of statistical evidence, evidence that sometimes challenges the simplistic assumptions that many of us might have about what's going on. But his work is not simply about studying the situation. It's also about proposing solutions. He was for a while a director of the research department at the World Bank. His advice is widely sought at the highest levels of government in many countries around the world. And as one of many indications of his influence, he received a knighthood in 2014 for services to promoting research and policy change in Africa. Problems of poverty and inequality are evident around the world, but there so often isn't there a double whammy as those at the bottom of the economic scale are more heavily exposed to other challenges, such as the rising cost of living here and in other places, or the effects of climate change whatever it may be. Sir Paul has written widely and very accessibly about poverty, including several books which I can wholeheartedly recommend. Look him up. His passion to address the issues is abundantly apparent. So it was with very great pleasure 
that I invite Sir Paul to deliver his lecture. Well, thank you very much indeed um, to the university, to the society for inviting me. Um, and thank you to you for braving a pretty chill evening and coming out uh, to, to hear me. And of course, you in Barbados, um, you're, what should we say? Um, I don't know the 30th today was a, a gold star day in my diary. Um, when I got invited here, um, uh, and I'm sure it wasn't because of you, it was because November the 30th, today was the day that I was due to deliver my next book to my publisher. And so I thought, great, I can, I can come here, I can tell them about what's in the book, and it's, for me, it's a celebration of, yes, I finished this damn book, right? Um, I should explain, I'm trying to write a book which is easy to read. read. Books that are easy to read are really hard to write. Right? Um, and this book is about left behind places. Um, so that was the idea. And then over the last three months, uh, and only the last three months, something completely infuriating and exciting and invigorating happened. I finally understood what I was trying to say. And this is a, a, a process that I can only describe as sort of a, a, a chemistry, a, a, a catalyzer of previously half thought through ideas. Um, and, and it's a fantastic sense of intellectual excitement as these ideas form. It's why, it's why every researcher, and there are doubtless many researchers in this room, that's what you work for. That's why you do the research. It's so thrilling to get that moment of flow when it all happens, right? Um, it also has the infuriating consequence that you've got to change the damn book, right? Um, and so I had to let my publishers know, awfully sorry, but it's going to be a better book. That's the good news, but it's going to be very late. Right? Um, my publishers were um, understanding, right? Um, uh, and, and hopefully you will be, because instead of being able to stand here and present my book with a clear, orderly flow of this is what I've said, I'm still in that state of excitement and flux and flow and crystallizing. So the danger is this is going to be a complete muddle, right? Um, uh, what I hope it can do is share with you this sense of intellectual excitement, which is the thrill why we do research, right? Um, so how did I get to this three months? What was the triggering things? And it was partly triggered by experiences in places that needed to catch up, that were stuck, that were left behind, right? So last week, I was in Zambia. Right? Um, the new president, it's a very exciting moment for Zambia. I first met the president exactly a year ago here in, in Britain. Um, he'd emailed me to say, um, I'd like to meet you because I've read your books. Um, and uh, and I, I'd like to I'd like to meet you whilst I'm here. So that was a good start. He reads my books. That's always a, you know, a good sign, right? In my opinion, right? Unbiased. Um, so that was one set of experiences. And sure enough, he got a very good question. He said, "Here we are. Fifty years ago, we're a copper economy. Fifty years ago, we were richer than the other major copper economy, Chile." And now we're just about as poor as we were 50 years ago. And Chile is now a member of the OECD. What have they, why have they been able to soar past us when we've just been stuck? What have, what have we done wrong? And more importantly, what now should we do to catch up? 
earlier this month, uh, I was invited to um, a, a place, not a, so Zambia is a poor country that's stuck. Um, I was invited to a poor region of Colombia, uh, the Atlantic Caribbean region of Colombia, the beautiful region, but it's a very poor region of Colombia that has fallen behind. And they wanted to know why, why are we stuck when the rest of Colombia has moved on? Why are we falling behind? Now, in parallel with that, I was working on the poorest region in England, um, which is South Yorkshire and its core city of Sheffield. I was invited in by the mayor and the chief executive. And so for the last two and a half years, I've been going there, bringing a team of people um, who, who can help. I generally work in teams. Um, and uh, it was the same question in South Yorkshire. Um, why have we fallen so badly behind? Now, I grew up in South Yorkshire. I grew up in Sheffield. Huh? It was never a fashionable city, right? But it was modestly prosperous, right? Um, and yet it crashed in the early 80s. It had been a steel city for 700 years, specialist steel, very skilled workforce. It got smashed in about four years in the early 80s. Right? But it's still dirt poor it's still not recovered. And the mayor and the chief executive wanted to know why, why are we stuck? Right? So all these places were asking the same question in parallel and somewhat bizarrely, um, uh, Michael Gove um, asked me if I would uh, become advisor um, pro bono, that means they don't pay you, advisor on leveling up, right? Um, and I've, I've, I've come to have quite a respect for Michael Gove. He's a clever chap um, who's understood the key point, which we'll get to in a moment, and very few other people have. Um, so, he, so he appointed me as advisor on leveling up to the government, um, and uh, I'm supposed to report annually to Parliament from now until 2030, right? So, fair enough. And then he, he disappeared off the scene. There he's back, thank goodness, right? And we won't comment on the intervening time. Um, uh, so there's a clear question, why are these places, places stuck? Right? And economics, before I was at the Black School, I was one of the six professors of economics at Oxford at the time. And then I got a chair at Harvard. So uh, there is an orthodox economic answer to that question, why are you falling behind? And I'm going to give it to you. Right? It's going to be a slight parody, but I think it, I think it deserves it, right? It's, it's really the, uh, the, the orthodox account of why poor places are poor and don't catch up is the economics of Dr. Pangloss. Right? It goes like this. Um, don't worry, uh, there is a unique equilibrium uh, which uh, all economies attend to. And so um, if you fall behind, don't worry, market forces will drag you back to that equilibrium quite fast. And so you don't need any other interventions, just you'll catch up again. You fall, you catch up. But what happens if you don't catch up? Oh, well, that's because the world's changed and the place you're living in is now completely geographically unsuited uh, to, to, to growth. And so, so you're in the wrong place. Uh, we, we can't um, get on your bike. Um, it will be a distortion to do a place-based intervention to help you. And we know you lobbying for that, that's understandable, that's understandable, but it would cost 
It would be a, a wasteful subsidy. It would reduce the growth of the rest of the country. And so we don't want to do that. We in the treasury, this is the treasury orthodoxy, we know best, a standard approach, no place-based interventions, a standard approach because any place-based intervention is either unnecessary because you'll catch up anyway, or a waste because you'll reduce growth elsewhere. So we know best, standard approach everywhere is the right thing. No distortions. Right? Um, that's also true globally at the World Bank. Right? I used to direct the research center. It's full of very clever people, but one thing I could not get changed was there's a boilerplate model. The World Bank staff, very clever, they know best. Boilerplate, you do the same thing everywhere yeah. so that's where we are um i think that is utterly wrong right um and the truth is i think that there isn't a global equilibrium to which market forces push you there are multiple spatial equilibria both locally stable now that's a, a mouthful of a concept, lo multiple locally stable equilibrium. So let me give you an image. Yeah? And it's an image of a sailing dinghy. Yeah? Anybody here who's learned how to sail a dinghy? Yay, some people have, right? Um, you will realize that a, a, a dinghy has two locally stable equilibria, right? One is when it's the right way up. <laughs> And the other is when it's upside down. And the upside down equilibrium is all too locally stable, right? Um, you have to be taught how to turn it back up. It's, it's, a, it's a set of skills that you have to be taught. We'll come back to that. I'm going to call it a cognitive gadget, which you'll come to. Um, so, um, there's the reality uh, and the places that are like the Atlantic uh, Caribbean region of Colombia, Sheffield, Zambia, um, they're upside down capsized dinghies that are stuck in locally stable equilibria. They're on a different trajectory, namely very little growth, a different trajectory from other countries. Um, uh, now, we've, we're going to turn to uh, some uh, models that validate, uh, purport to validate the, um, that process of, um, of natural convergence. Right? They purport to validate the orthodoxy and their deeply misleading statistics. Um, I'm going to um, show you some data, uh, which is um, hopefully just coming on your screen now. This is about um, divergence amongst the poorest countries in the world, the 60 poorest countries, um, 60 left behind countries. Right? Um, the, the pernicious um, uh, statistical claims at the moment are that um, we've got uh, automatic convergence. We don't need to worry about the poorest countries because they're catching up with everybody else. And that seems to be right until you look more closely. Um, so we've got three groups here, the 60 left behind, the emerging market economies, which are awful lot, lot of it's about six billion people, and then the lucky billion plus at the top, the OECD. So there's three groups of countries, covers the whole world between them, and there are three time periods. Now, the, trick, the, the key thing to note here is that that middle time, so we've got everybody pre-2003, from independence to 2003, um, 2003 to 14, is a middle period, and it's a very unusual period. 
we're not looking here at a trend that's been going on for 40 years. We're looking at a, a deviant decade, which I sometimes call the golden decade. It was, it was a series of wonderful things that were very good for the poorest countries in the world. And then that whatever was happening to them, China, debt forgiveness, commodity super cycle, all that ended and they crashed from 2014 on to the end of 2019. COVID is a different story. They're in an even deeper problem with COVID. But we'll take these three periods and we're using some new data. This is all World Bank data on the changing wealth of nations. The best estimates of future growth should be the, uh, the increase in your wealth, whether it's investment or savings. And uh, this is what this data is showing. It's the change per capita in total wealth. And for the left behind, the story is tragic. Prior to 2003, the long-term trend, the annual change in per capita wealth was negative, way behind both everybody, everybody else in the world. They were falling behind. This was the slow death of stagnation. The, interview, the middle period, when everything went right for them, they used their opportunities fairly well. And so wealth per capita increased quite rapidly, 3% a year. And then if we go back to what's called the new normal, after the super cycle ended, they're back to rapid decline. And so the, they're diverging from everybody else, both in the new normal and the pre-2003 period. That's divergence big time. But if you run the statistical regression just through that lot, it's dominated by the 6 billion countries of the emerging market, which are catching up with everybody else. And a lot of the left behind get missed out because there isn't enough data to cover them. And so that's the, the, the myth of uh, an automatic convergence that has been perpetrated, and it's wrong. Thank you. Um, now we're going to turn to um, recent advances in science, um, because the really exciting message here is that um, uh, policies should vary country by country. It's actually efficient to have different policies in different places. Context matters. So you need to vary the policy interventions according to the local context. But who knows the local context best? Is it places like the World Bank and the US and the, and the Treasury? No, the people who know local context best are local people. And so the punchline of this lecture is that um, the modern advances in research, which I'm going to go through in a moment, what they advocate is different policies according to context and who should do those policies, the local people. If they are to do them, they need to have agency. And so instead of the top knowing best, the British Treasury knowing best, the World Bank knowing best, you've got to do the opposite. It's local people who know best. And only if you devolve agency to them will you get an efficient uh, process of mutual convert of, of, the, of the poorest catching up. Right? So that's the, the sort of punchline of the, the lecture. Um, uh, it's true even if you stick within economics. The latest advances in uh, regional economics show that far from the market forces happily taking you back to that unique equilibrium. Once a place has crashed, like Sheffield did, um, market forces amplify the divergence. Okay. 
And there are many reasons for that. It's all published in the literature now. So that I can take as given. Um, uh, what's more exciting, much more exciting, is that um, once the place has crashed, become a lot poorer, poverty produces a load of further problems. Uh, once Sheffield became poor, once any region becomes poor, you get a lot of political problems, social problems, psychological problems, moral problems. And what we need, and those then become a syndrome which interact with each other and reinforce the collapse. The only way of breaking out from those collapses, those traps, is if you try and understand and integrate all those different subjects, the political, the social, the psychological, the, the philosophical, right? Um, and that's hard. We haven't got an integrated social science that has done that. We need it, but we haven't got it. So either you stay in your little academic silo of your subject, in which case you can be precise, but you'll be, be precisely wrong, or you can be roughly right because that's the best we can hope for at the moment. Have a go at integrating these things. It's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong, in my opinion. And I am an intellectual maverick who has stuck with a problem of the left behind. And as that problem has needed different disciplines, I've tried to learn about those disciplines. I'm an amateur, but I've been very fortunate to work with professionals. And so I've got a working knowledge of three major new advances that I want to share with you. And the first is evolutionary social psychology. Economics has picked up quite a lot of individualist psychology. They call it biases. But it's not the individual psychology that's the needed here. It's social psychology. And it's not any old social psychology, it's evolutionary social psychology. We are a mammal that has evolved in a very peculiar way to become quite remarkably pro-social. Why? Because when we came down from the trees to survive, the only communities which survived were the communities that learned how to collaborate. We also know that about 80% of our decisions are taken not by our individual, rational, greedy, lazy, selfish brain, as economics thinks. 80% right? of our decisions are taken by the collective mind of our network community. We behave according to the norms and ideas of a network community. And we learn how to do that through evolutionary pressure. Right? We're still a mammal. And like all mammals, we can be dragged down into greedy, lazy, selfish if we have, find ourselves in an organization which is very badly behaved and very badly led, right? For some reason, into my mind comes an image of those London lawyers uh, heroically defending um, uh, the oligarchs uh, so that they can retain their super yachts, right? You will have followed that in the press, I hope. Um, the, um, but it doesn't have to be like that. There are many examples, and I'll come across them later tonight, of communities which actually manage to behave remarkably well. Right? So um, the, um, that's, the, that's the first area, evolutionary social psychology. Um, the, um, the second area 
is um, uh, moral philosophy, not the utilitarianism that tended to dominate for the last 40 years, uh, which is the individualist calculus of I'm good if the consequences I intend from my actions add up to uh, a net plus for other people. Right? Um, that uh, calculus of, uh, of intended consequences produced um, the extraordinarily named Bank Freed, Bankman Freed, who you may have read about. Bankman Freed, who uh, has just uh, run off with the, the biggest crypto scam in human history, uh, with devastating consequences for millions of poor people around the world who've been suckered. The, the people who are most suckered by these things are the people who are poorest and therefore most desperate. Uh, that's what uh, Bank and Freed has achieved. He did say, sorry, I intended to do well. I was going to make a few billion and give it all away. So I'm all right, really. I'm justified. Um, the, um, the, the, the moral philosophy that I buy into was pioneered by Adam Smith in the theory of moral sentiments. Um, and its most recent development is by Michael Sandel, the, the most eminent moral philosopher in the world, I think, at Harvard. And there, the idea of morality is not this calculus of intended consequences. It's relationships of mutual trust and kindness between people in a community. That, to my mind, is morality. Um, the uh, the final, so we want to do evolutionary social psychology, we want to do moral philosophy, and finally, we're going to do um, decisions under uncertainty. Um, and uh, decisions under uncertainty, um, if you're in a utilitarian bureaucracy and you're facing uncertainty, um, and you're going to be judged by the utilitarian calculus. Do you know what a bureaucracy does if there's a lot of uncertainty? It does nothing. Because nobody gets sacked if they intend to do nothing. The consequences of nothing are nothing. And so bureaucracies freeze up when there's uncertainty. But what we need when there's uncertainty is action despite the uncertainty. If the transition out of poverty in a place like Sheffield or Zambia or the Atlantic Caribbean region, that transition will take a generation and it will be highly uncertain. We need action despite the uncertainty. And that's been developed. The answer to what, how do you do that, how do you get action, is pioneered by the greatest, the great Scottish economist, John Kay, with whom I've just written a book called Greed is Dead. Um, I learned more from partnering with John than any other person in my, in my entire life. Um, and the, the key message of how do you overcome uncertainty is if you don't know what is going to happen, find out, learn quickly. And let me give you one image which encapsulates um, very rapid learning, and it was by the great Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping came in after the disasters of Mao, um, and his challenge, as he described it, was to try and modernize China. It was, he said it's like crossing a wide river um, where there's no bridge. And so what you have to do is try and ford the bridge and you feel one stepping stone at a time. And it's that image of feeling for the next stepping stone, which is the right approach in this gargantuan task of getting, of breaking the trap of left behind places. Deng followed that through with a strategy 
where he had experiments in parallel. I had a five-year program, five-year program, here's my objective. You're the 40 people who are going to be the, the, the young cadre, the most elite in China, in the Communist Party. You'll each become governor of a province. Here's the goal I want to set to you. We want to reduce infant mortality. I don't know how to do it. Modesty. Right? Here's the goal. You try something. Does the bureaucracy freeze up with the message it doesn't know how we don't know how to do it? No, he anticipates that. He said, We'll be watching you. If you've not done anything in the first six months, you're a failure. You're thrown out. Yeah? We'll be watching you. If you succeed, we'll hoover that up and share that information. Right? Places are different. What works for you, great, it's working. But it may be that sitting there is different from sitting there. But maybe you over there should go and have a look. Right? They do that every five years for 40 years. It ushers in the fastest growth, and the fastest poverty reduction ever seen in human history. That's rapid learning in action. OK, let's turn to something a little sadder which is Britain's regional problem, our very own regional problem. Could we have chart one? Um, this is um, uh, a chart showing life chances. What are life chances? They're your, the chance that if you are born in, uh, in the bottom part of society, what's the chance that you will end up in the top half. So it's about social mobility between one generation and the next. Right? Um, there are four awful Latin American countries with the worst uh, measured chances, life chances on earth. Uh, and then there's a dead heat between Italy and the United Kingdom. Italy, famously, two nations sellotaped to, into one. The desperately backward south from Sicily and the booming, vibrant north. Right? Well, Britain is as bad as that. Right? Um, what's driving it? Why? Are we so completely exceptional? I mean, the difference is huge. By the time you get to Denmark, you're talking vast orders of magnitude of more equal life chances. So why are life chances in Britain so bad? There's two things driving it. It's very straightforward. One is, did your parents go to university? If the answer is yes, that's good. The next question is, do you live in the southeast of England or East Scotland? If the answer is yes, you've, you've ticked both boxes. You're in the best place on earth. Your kids will do well regardless. Huh? I call those kids camouflage clots. Huh? If you've given birth to a camouflage clot, and you've got those two boxes ticked, don't worry, they'll do just fine. If you tick the other two boxes, you don't live in one of those, you don't live in the right geography, and your parents didn't go to university. Sorry, sorry, love, forget it. Right? Britain is the worst place for you in the whole of the OECD. Right? You can count your lucky stars, you're not in Peru, right? So um, that is compounded, that inequality of life chances is compounded by inequality in current incomes. Um, here we bring the two together. And uh, so intergenerational earnings mobility, very, very low. Here's Britain up here wonderfully high down here, right? Um, 
And what we're looking at here is um, just income inequality, right? Um, United Kingdom looks really awful, um, where um, uh, even less intergenerationally mobile than the United States. And by the time we get down to the cluster of Scandinavian countries, we're massively different. Um, so um, why is Britain so bad? Um, and the answer is because we've got extreme concentration um, of power of decision uh, in London and Edinburgh. Right? Um, it's not just government, it's everything. It's government, it's media, it's finance, it's the courts, it's the infrastructure. It's all concentrated in the booming region. Right? It doesn't have to be like that, but it is in Britain. Um, the because of that, it destroys the chances of local knowledge being used by local people. Yeah? So let's have a look at um, here's a couple of charts on um, the uh, regional inequality. Uh, you see where Britain is? The gap between Britain and the next. <laughs> It is bigger than the gap between the, the next and the best. I mean, we're off the map, regionally unequal. And we're also really pretty um, uh, 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 unequal in terms of local authority autonomy. Um, uh, this one shows um, local authority autonomy. We'll briefly we'll skip to the next one, which is... Um, uh, the same thing only with fiscal powers. And now let's go to the last one, um, which is this, which is kind of really rather sad. Um, this is the UK compared to uh, the rest of Europe, life chances and regional inequality. And just look at us. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a crushing disgrace that we are so regionally unequal compared to anywhere else in Europe. Um, we know what's needed. It's not complete, roughly, right? this is roughly right, the next things I'm gonna say. We need devolved powers. We need a, an automatic revenue transfer mechanism between poor regions and rich ones based on some objective deprivation rather than political lobbying. Uh, and we need local control over a chunk of the taxes that are collected nationally. We haven't got any of them, right? That's what we need all of them. Um, we've known that we've needed all of them for an enormously long time. Uh, in particular, the lack of finance for small and medium firms in a poor region became so apparent um, that uh, it became apparent in the 1920s, so much so that in 1931, a committee um, recommended action. 1931, right? 91 years ago. That committee was called the Macmillan Committee. It was led by Harold Macmillan, huh? who then became prime minister. Even he, as prime minister, couldn't do anything about it. What on earth is going on? Why have we not done anything about it for all this time? And there's a very simple answer. When political parties are out of power, they often promise devolution. Sometimes they put it on tablets of stone, right? But when they get into power, they change their minds because it would mean giving power away. And we, need, we know how to use it really well. And so 
they're anal retentive, right? There's no incentive to give power away. And that's why for 91 years, we've known what to do and we've never done it. Right? Um, so on that happy note, um, let's, um, let's look at something more cheerful. We can, yeah. Um, uh, you can get change. Uh, you can do it from the top, you can do it from the bottom. Uh, I'm going to look at purposive leadership. I'm going to tell you the story of uh, Zelensky. And Zelensky uh, draws on all three things that I want to use them bad models that mispredict, the good models, and the rapid learning. So, bad models and Zelensky. Um, uh, I used to work on conflict, violent conflict. And just as I accepted this, thinking, oh yeah, I can do that, huh? November the 30th celebration, I was invited ages ahead by the Department of War Studies at King's College, which is the fanciest conflict department probably in the world. I was invited to give the opening keynote at a conference like this. Right? Um, and I'd said yes, and it was in my diary for the very beginning of March this year. By the very beginning of March, two weeks earlier, Putin had just invaded. And so I couldn't stand up and say, I'm going to talk about conflict in Guatemala. Um, I had to say, I'm going to talk about conflict in the Ukraine. Right? And so the first thing I did was I went to the models. And I had a look, what's the models say? And the models were all very fancy, quantitative, all coming up with a high degree of precision probability 0.9999, Putin will walk over the Ukraine. And what were the models doing? They were precise. Right? They were precisely wrong. Um, they were measuring tanks, airplanes, number of soldiers, number of Kalashnikovs and that sort of thing. And then there were complicated issues of what's the trade-off between a tank and an aeroplane, all that rubbish, right? I, by then, I learned enough from the social psychology, the moral philosophy, and the decisions under uncertainty to stand up and to the astonishment of the audience, I put my professional neck out and said, I predict that, uh, that Zelensky uh, will defeat Putin. It was so far, that prediction was roughly right. Eh? Remember the choice, roughly right or precisely wrong. Right? So what, what was Zelensky doing that made him, that made him, that made me think he would, he would win? First, his morals. You remember what he did? He sacrificed his own self-interest very publicly. I am staying in Kiev. Goodbye, this might well be the last time I can speak to you. That was a very dramatic personal sacrifice. Having done that, he then had the decency, the modesty to say, I'm not a military man. I'm going to devolve agency to you. I'm laying down my life. You, if you're a Ukrainian man, you have a moral duty to join your local militia. I'll get you the guns. You then have to work out to how, to, how to use them against the Russians. And then the great insight of rapid learning. He said, we, have, we will win because we have one advantage. You in your local area know your context, the context of the terrain. You know your terrain a lot better than the Russians. That is why we will win. We will use context as our advantage. Right? And that was the rapid learning. So far, it's worked. Right? Um, I'll give you two examples of places that did rather similar things. Pittsburgh in America. 
Pittsburgh was a steel city, very like Sheffield. It crashed disastrously. Yeah? It was a, it was it was a, it was a, half its population left. Right? It's now one of the most prosperous cities in America. So how did it revive? Right? Well, it revived because its mayors and its governors of its state had a lot of authority and they used that authority to build mutual responsibility so the business community in the state and in Pittsburgh and the universities all worked to a common purpose encouraged by good leadership. Um, my final example uh, is East Germany. East Germany, in 1990, when unification happened, it was very much poorer than, Sheffield, than South Yorkshire. Right? Now, it is very much richer. So South Yorkshire is left behind by a place that overtook it, dramatically so. How? What happened? First, West Germans were, rose to a sense of duty and obligation to help East Germany. There was a purpose that united them. And secondly, uh, they introduced an institution which delivered it. And that institution was called KFW. It had been founded after the Second World War with the explicit purpose of regenerating um, Germany. Right? And by the time, um, as soon as the task became East Germany recovery, KFW was switched to do that. This was big stuff. It was about 70 billion pounds a year for 30 years. Right? KFW has a, a labor force of 7,000 staff with 80 regional offices. Huh? It's capitalized at 500 billion pounds. Last year, Britain set up a, an, a, its own version of KFW. Huh? It's called the National Infrastructure Bank. And amongst other things, its stated purpose is to help poor, pe poor regions to catch up within Britain. Yeah. Great, we've done it. Yeah. It took us till 2021 to do it. Um, Germany started in 1947, um, but there is an order of magnitude difference. Yeah. Remember the number 71 billion for 30 years. Um, the National Infrastructure Bank um, uh, has uh, 22 billion for 10 years. Yeah. Um, uh, spread over the whole country, right? Um, remember those 7,000 staff in KFW? Um, uh, the National Infrastructure Bank has, at the latest count, 127 staff, right? Um, capitalized in Britain at 22 billion, uh, KFW currently capitalized at 500 billion, right? These are orders of magnitude different. We're not serious. Right? Um, so that was a top-down process of leadership. Let me finally turn to a bottom-up process, and I'll give you one example, and it's the Basque region. And the uh, Basque region uh, was a catastrophe. It was a combination of an industrial collapse, like Sheffield, very bad industrial collapse. It was the Rust Belt of Spain, compounded by major violence, ETA. Yeah. And so it was a disaster. Yeah. Um, it's now um, got the lowest poverty rate in the whole of Spain. It's a very prosperous region. So it was a disaster, 
of the first order, and it's now a spectacular success. How did that happen? And it wasn't top-down leadership, it was bottom-up. The guy who achieved that is called Jose. He's a priest, he's an old man now, um, but he um, started in very unpropitious, unpropitious circumstances. He was in a little town, he was a priest in a little town of 7,000 people, a broken town. And his principles were solidarity uh, and uh, mutuality and uh, participation. Everybody's got to participate. And he built a little institution to do that, which was a cooperative. And it was a cooperative based around training. We've got to get practical. We've got to train, learn how to do um, recovery. Um, so it was a very unpromising start by this young priest. Um, where is it now? It employs over 80,000 people. It has over 250 companies within its portfolio. It's the uh, biggest uh, enterprise in the Basque country. It's the seventh biggest enterprise in the whole of Spain. It's been a massive success and it was all a bottom-up process. So if he can do that in very unpropitious circumstances, so can we. Right? Um, I've just got time, I hope, for um, one last story, which is from a very poor country. And uh, it's, uh, I'm going to use the concept of a cultural gadget and talk about drones. Um, uh, drones used to deliver blood to clinics. Yeah. Celia Hayes, the great um, uh, evolutionary social psychologist, would describe that invention of drones to deliver blood as a cognitive gadget. Yeah. Um, where was it that invented? Who had that idea to deliver blood by drones to, 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 to clinics? Right? Um, well, who developed drones? Amazon. Amazon. What is Amazon? It's a brilliant website um, and very clever people um, and logistics. Right? So they developed drones. What did they develop them for? Well, they did develop them to deliver packages to people who ordered stuff on a website, right? So that was the problem they solved. And they go, oh, there's the machine. It takes off from the box. It's very clever, right? Did they go the one step extra and say, not only could we deliver packages, we could deliver blood to clinics? No, they didn't. Let's go across to the other side of America to the Pentagon. They also developed drones. Slightly different purpose. This was targeted death to people they thought were terrorists, right? So same very fancy technology developed. Oh, uh, brilliant. Did they think, oh, not only could we deliver targeted death, we could deliver targeted life? No, they didn't. Right? Just down the street from the Pentagon is the World Bank. Now, that does have a whole big vice presidency on health. And they're very clever people. And so they've got the purpose of delivering health in very poor countries. And they're very clever people. Did they come up with it? Did they think, oh, we could use drones not to kill people or through the packages, but to deliver blood. No. Does anybody know who thought of how to use blood? Who came up with this idea? No? Rwanda. Rwanda. Why did they think of it in Rwanda? Because they knew their context better than anybody else. 
they knew the terrain in Uganda in, in Rwanda was very hilly and there was no road network that was adequate and they were broke. They had to come up with something cheap or give up. And so they developed a mindset of innovation. They were the ones who thought about it. And now the happy news that once you've got that cognitive gadget of a drone to deliver blood, it can spread to other places where it will be useful. Is West Scotland delivering blood by drone to clinics? I imagine it would be quite useful. I don't know whether you're doing it. We are. Well done. You spoiled my punchline. I'll tell you where it's spread first in a network community. And the network community didn't include Scotland. The network community did include other African countries. That was a network community. And so now Ghana is delivering more blood by drone to clinics than Rwanda. And that is the, 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 the good news that once poor countries realize that their context is their advantage, then they can come up with these great ideas and those ideas can spread, even sometimes to us. Let me conclude. Um, there are vast differences in life chances, and those vast differences in life chances are entirely avoidable. I feel this very personally because my own situation ticked both of the boxes of disadvantage. I was born in Sheffield, a very unfashionable place, and both my parents left school age 12. And so they had no chance in life. They stayed fairly poor, respectable, just on the lower edge of clinging on to respectability. They had no chance in life. But thank God, Britain got one good, modest leader just in time for me. He was called Clement Attlee, and he set up all the institutions that took me from that beginning all the way through to a doctorate at Oxford, all financed by the state. And for that, I am eternally grateful. We need more Clement Attlee modest leaders. If you remember, he was famously accused by Churchill of somebody who said to Churchill, he's a very modest man. And Churchill said, he's much to be modest about. Well, he's much to be proud about as well. Right? Um, what we ought to do is fairly obvious, but we're an upside down dinghy. Britain is an upside down dinghy, we're stuck. If you're an upside down dinghy, you need to learn from others how to turn that dinghy right. right? We refuse to learn from others. Why do we refuse to learn from others? The British Treasury is arrogant beyond belief, just as the World Bank refuses to learn from others. It's arrogant beyond belief. We need a dose of humility. How much more before we find a modesty to learn? Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. I think you can hear uh, the, the way in which your lecture has been appreciated. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating description and hugely thought provoking. So much so I can guarantee there'll be plenty of questions coming your way. 
Um, I would ask when the questions come, please be concise uh, so that we can get as many questions in as possible. Those online who are listening, please use the question and answer facility, not the chat facility, and we will sort out uh, the questions that way. Uh, the other thing to say, however, is that we're going to have a very brief pause of two minutes, during which we will set up the roving mics. We will give Sir Paul a chance to catch his breath. I know that sometimes people travel uh, some distances to get here. It may be you, that you have to slip out, uh, in which case feel free to do that, to catch trains and, and whatever. Uh, but we will start again with the questions in two minutes time. Thank you. Okay, folks, let's begin. Can I just remind you, uh, please, when you ask a question, be as concise as you can, and then we'll fit as many in as we can. Um, please forgive me for stating the obvious, but if the microphone comes to you, uh, the trick is to point it at your mouth, not at the ceiling. And that will ensure that we all hear very clearly. Can I, can I just also interject? Um, I'm as deaf as a post, so please speak up. If I give you an ad inadequate answer, and that's because I haven't heard it right. Um, <laughs> Let's have the first question. Yes, the lady over here. Thank you very much. I've got a question about place-based in, uh, uh, initiatives. For over many decades, I've worked for, the, um, for projects funded by the European Regional Development Fund, and I wondered whether you would think that was genuinely place-based initiative, or whether it was a, there was fa fa whether there were fa there was a failed place-based initiatives, the European Regional Development Funds. Oh yes, so we we've got lots of little funds. The problem is they're not big enough and they're not sustained enough. Right? So, of course, we need regional funds. We need bigger sustained. In fact, it's got just look at East, look, look at the, what, what it costs East, in East Germany, right? 10% of German GDP for 30 years was poured in, right? With a big institution that managed it. That's the scale of serious. Even with all that, East Germany is still poorer than West Germany. So we've, we've got little pots. It's very nice. We've got about, I've, I've just been counting them. I, 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 one of my bits of advice to Michael Gove was count how many pots you've got and then get rid of them. Next question. A gentleman right at the back there. Keep your hand up, please. Oh, sorry, is it a lady? It's a lady, I beg your pardon. I say it's not that good. Hold it like this, not like that, like this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. I work in the humanitarian and development sector, and a lot of what you were saying reminds me of a discussion we are having just now on localization. Um, and I think for, for me, like, it's not that we don't know that we have inefficiencies baked into the system because decisions are delocalized. We do know this, but many of the decision makers are incentivized to hold on to the, the decision making power that they have. How do you challenge those power structures? Yeah, um, that's the right question. <laughs> <laughs> I've just tried, right? Um, the only answer is um, we've got to create a groundswell of opinion that says enough is enough, right? If, and I think this is a good moment, here's the hopeful bit, if not now, when? For goodness sake, right? How much more do things have to fall apart before we say enough? Right. So that's if not now, when? And the next question is, if not me, who? Right. Do we leave it to somebody else? I've tried to give you here examples, you know, a priest in a little town made a vast difference. Right. Zelensky, a good leader made a vast difference because he had a purpose. He wasn't trying to aggrandize himself for once, he got a purpose and so brought people together, made demands on people. So 
we can do it. I am completely incompetent in social media. I don't even try. I don't tweet or Twitter or whatever it is, right? But I try and reach young people because young people have a great skill, which is social media. Right? And the power of youth in social media is what swept the crooked incumbent president out of Zambia and brought Hichilema, the new president, into power. It was youth backing him. They said, you sound as if you're speaking the truth. You've got a strategy. You're being honest, and we're going to support you. And that created a tidal wave of, uh, of, of the youth vote, which swept the crooked incumbent out. Right? So youth can be an enormous force for good. It can equally be an enormous force for bad. Right? Just as we can be dragged up or dragged down. So that's the best I can do. It's a struggle and we've got to win it. And old men can be just as impatient as young men in wanting <laughs> to hurry up. Was there a second question at the back? And then gentleman here and then an online. You showed some depressing charts comparing the UK with other um, large countries within Europe. Um, one difference is the electoral system used, uh, well, in our case, for the Westminster government. I think we're unique in having first past the post, whereas the other countries have some form of proportional representation. Do you think that's uh, significant in helping maintain a long term strategy in government? Um, I think to get a, a long term strategy in government, you need something that is, uh, goes beyond party politics. So you need to actually try and build some common purpose um, that, is, uh, that is across parties. Um, I'll give you an example um, that's happening now in Bangladesh. It's a young man, a remarkable young man from a very humble background um, who's running a network which is built up to 35,000 young people, uh, aged sort of about 20 to 30, educated. And he's built this network. Um, he gets uh, distinguished old guys like me to, to speak on it. Um, and uh, uh, the, they have a protocol. And the protocol is that um, Everybody has got to be courteous, all political views included, um, uh, but um, uh, nobody is allowed to be rude or, um, or, or not listen to uh, others. So you try and get the, the 35,000 break out into discussion groups to say, how can we use this knowledge we've heard in our own context? It's become so influential that top politicians are queuing up to try and join it, to comment and join it. Join the, so it's very influential, but its protocol is we're not putting up with ideological uh, uh, opposition. We're, we're trying to find common purpose across different political allegiances. That, I think, is what's needed. Um, I should also say that there's a very clear relationship between devolving power and participation. So in Britain, the turnout at local elections is in the range about 20 to 25%. Most people just don't bother to vote because local governments have so little power and they know it. In continental Europe, where there's much greater devolution, turnout at elections is in the range 75 to 85%. People hold their local government to account because they know it's got money and powers and it matters. And that forces uh, the parties to be non-extreme 
because most people are not extreme. Britain is governed by the 1% who join political parties. 1% of the adult population is the most extreme people on the right, the most extreme people on the left. So the 1% choose the menu. Do you want idiot A or idiot B? And the rest of us then choose. And the none of the above isn't on the menu. <laughs> Gentlemen, halfway up. You mentioned um, social media a, a minute ago. Um, I've got a question related to your examples of the Basque and of Germany, uh, East Germany, and not so much social media, but where does the media in general stand in these countries compared to the power of the press barons in the UK? Where does the what? Where does the media stand, the press, etc., compared to the power of the the mirror, the um, mail, the telegraph, etc. Here, good, that's a good question. Um, uh, the honest answer for the Basque countries, I don't know. Right? Um, for um, Germany, uh, the media is much more devolved. Uh, much more devolved. You've got a regional media. You used to have a regional media in Britain, and it collapsed. I mean, it's a tragedy now that the the uh, there used to be a thing called the Sheffield Telegraph and the Manchester uh, Guardian. And the Sheffield Telegraph is no more. And the, uh, and the Manchester Garden, Guardian um, survived by moving to, to London. So the, 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 we've lost a regional press. It's terrible. But it's, but it's all bound up with the fact that um, the regional press can't report on local issues because no, there's no local power to do things. And so everything is focused on politics in London and this polarized uh, system. I think the question is more um, the fact that the reason problems of this world is having to carry the data. Oh, I see. Um, that is a good question. Um, I I really don't know is the, is the honest truth. Um, is there an online question? Yes, we've got a few. Um, Kristen Morrison asks, what can be done about the prevailing attitude in some parts of Britain that the state, the council should do it, whatever needs doing? How do we galvanize innovation, imagination, energy from the bottom up? Yeah, um, the, um, um, that is, that, that's, a good, that's a good question. That there's in, most people are not given anything like um, the, the, the powers to use their potential. Um, and so most people are performing way under their potential and there's a lot of survey work which shows that it's got much, much worse because businesses and indeed public organizations have got more and more run from the top down. Um, and so work satisfaction has declined consistently. Um, uh, I have always run the organizations I've run have always been run as teams in which we have a common purpose. And I've, I've adopted one principle, which is if you in the team feel that you know how to answer this, what to do in this situation, do it. Right? If you don't know, don't feel obliged to, to, to do something. You can always ask me or anybody else. But if you feel confident, do it. If it doesn't work, um, we learn something. We don't expect anybody to get everything right. And so I never criticize things that go wrong. Um, I always support that, that principle that if you feel you can do it, do it. And what that reveals in the end is a massive increase in commitment because 
people recognize they are part of a team, they are jointly responsible. Huh? Um, my, my, I've got two PAs because I'm kind of busy, but um, one of my PAs um, has a cup uh, and on it is written just the words, Professor Sir. Um, I, I grew up in a household where if you're given something like a knighthood, it would be deeply pretentious to refuse it, and it would be even more pretentious to use it. Um, <laughs> and so when I do something really even more than usually idiotic, she gives me a cup of tea with Professor Sir on it. <laughs> um, and that's the spirit that, um, that makes a difference. Um, uh, I think, Adrian, you will testify that I've got a staff which is second to none. You're a very lucky man. <laughs> Question from a lady at the back and then the gentleman at the front. Thank you. Going back to the question from just behind me about the deficiencies of first past the post, would you agree that in the Westminster system, we have the leaders of the two main parties who do have a commonality of purpose and our dinghy is really stuck upside down? Yeah, I, um, I think that um, uh, a proportional representation system um, uh, works much better than the first past the post because it forces um, people to, to work in, 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 in cooperation uh, and so it stabilizes uh, the range. Here we've, here we've got these, these, these oscillations between extremes which are extremely damaging, I think. So um, trying to build, a, I'm, a, I'm a, an advocate of what I call the hard center um, uh, the hard center is one that says we're proud of being centrists. Um, uh, we're not a soft center which uh, apologizes for not holding the extremist views. We believe in the center. And so that I, I'm a believe in pragmatism because we never know enough to know what utopia is. There is no utopia. Right? Where if in a dynamic, uncertain world, the best we can hope for is providence, that things on average will arc to the best. And I do believe in that. Right? Um, so there's no utopia. Anybody who says, has an ideology which says, this is the way, whether it's Marxist or capitalist, is obviously wrong, right? obviously in my view. It's just the basic fundamentals of, 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 um, of decisions under uncertainty say, you can't identify a utopia and stick there. That's not the nature of the life we're in. Um, so um, pragmatism, um, pragmatism plus strategy, that attempt to, to, to learn rapidly, that's the best we can do. But we're not doing it anything like. One more question. Professor, sir, <laughs> <laughs> you, you intrigued us at the beginning of your talk by saying that you'd had this Eureka sort of moment where you've, you'd worked on this book for ages, and then suddenly I had to rethink because a different perspective came to you. What was that? Okay, let me spell it out. Um, it was the realization that far from this standard model of we do the same thing everywhere being right, it was catastrophically wrong because the knowledge of local context could be turned to advantage. Once you start to see the differences 
that a poor region has from a rich one. Once you start to see that as that's the advantage and who knows about it best, we do, that's the key insight, that using difference to advantage. I'll give you a little example. When I flew into and out of Heathrow, sorry, when I flew out of Heathrow today, I noticed um, uh, two jets, a Finnair jet just coming in um, and a uh, ice, Air Iceland just going out. And Finland and Iceland have both in the last few years developed a very big, very successful airline. They both hit on the same idea, which is let's use the polar route. Let's use our weird locations far up in the north where it's too bloody cold. Right? Let's use those to advantage. And so the polar route to the Atlant across the Atlantic is Iceland's developed it. The polar route to the Northeast a Asia, that's what Finn has developed. It, will it last? It'll run for the next 20 years. And then, then, then that will burn out. But with a mindset of innovation, they'll think up with someone else. Right? That's, the, the, that's what life is like. There are some nations which just keep turning their local context to advantage, right? And some which don't. Right? One final question from the gentleman over here, and then we'll draw to a close. Was Michael Gove right to dismiss the need for experts? Say it again. Was Michael Gove correct in dismissing the need for experts? <laughs> Um, uh, what he has understood, so let's give him some credit where it's due, he's understood that market forces are pernicious in left behind places, that you actually have to have active intervention to offset these market forces. What did he mean by um, ex you know, all that silly remark about experts? Um, you better ask him. Um, but um, uh, I'm an expert, but my expertise, I know its limitations, right? I'm not saying I can give you the precise truth. I've told you, I think I can be roughly right. Yeah? And so I think um, modesty in everything, including in expertise, would not be a bad thing. And perhaps that's, if we're generous, perhaps that's what he meant. <laughs> on that note, I fear we're going to have to draw the discussion to a close. Uh, we, we could go on all night. And I'll remind you that there is a reception outside where you're most welcome to have a drink and keep talking. But for the moment, I really would like to thank Sir Paul very warmly for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come and give us such a fascinating evening and giving us so much to think about. We really appreciate it greatly. In a moment, you will have the opportunity to show your own appreciation in the usual way. But before we do that, uh, there's a, a short um, presentation from the president of the Royal Philosophical Society, Professor Pat Monaghan. Thank you. Um... <clears throat> Professor Sir, <laughs> uh, it's a great pleasure for me to present to Sir Paul Collier, uh, the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow's Adam Smith Medal. Now the links to Adam Smith in the lecture that we've just heard are clear. Paul has told us about the wealth of nations being linked to the wealth of communities, and that the wealth of communities can translate into the wealth of individuals. But to reach that, we need to decentralize, we need to localize, and it's the local understanding that we need to get the decision making to that level. Because in the local level, you have, in a way, that sympathy of sentiment, which was central 
to Adam Smith's other book, The Theory of Moral Sentiment. And I think we've heard all of that captured in this lecture. So on behalf in, of the University of Glasgow, but primarily on behalf of the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, it is my great pleasure to present to Sir Paul the Adam Smith Medal, and please join me in congratulating him on a wonderful lecture. What can I say? Uh, uh, the right answer would be as little as possible, please. Uh, thank you enormously. I, you cannot, I cannot tell you how much this means to me, um, not least because my friend and mentor, John Kay, I will, I will say, yes, I got this medal. <laughs> thank you very much.